Hello, everyone. I have 12 o'clock, so we are going to get started. Welcome to the Virtual Water Ambassador Program 2021. We are pleased to be back this year um, and we're encouraged by your feedback and enthusiasm from the 2020 webinar series. Um, you can see on the right hand side, we've got a list of webinars for you through March. We will be continuing this program through July um, within every other Tuesday schedule. So be on the lookout for our later dates. Um, we'll advertise them as we start scheduling them along. And if you haven't already registered for our future um, January and February programs, um, please do so. So just to familiarize yourselves with the Zoom platform, although we're all pretty familiar with it by this point in COVID, um, we have muted all of you. We ask that you don't unmute yourselves. This way we um, don't have conflicts with our speaker. If you are connected and you can't hear me right now, click the up carrot button and that will allow you to adjust your audio settings. And usually it just is because you happen to have the wrong speaker or microphone selected. So it's usually a pretty easy fix. Um, we, you do have the capabilities to share your video. We ask that you don't just for bandwidth issues. Um, if you have good connection and you want to show us your happy smiley faces, then feel free to do so. On the bottom, you can see the participant list. This allows you to see who is joining us today. We ask that you use uh, the chat box for all questions and answers. We will be, hi Susan, <laughs> we will be um, holding all questions until the end. So just type them in and then we'll get to them at the end. We have recorded this. So, and we'll be posting all of the recordings on the Martin County Sea Grant website and we'll show you the link for that later. And if you need to leave us for any reason, you can click the leave meeting button, which is usually on the lower right hand corner. And we suggest you using the side by side mode for view settings uh, with speaker highlighted. This allows you to see the presenter. Again, we are recording these so you can view them at a later point in time. And this is that crazy long link for you. You can just Google Martin County Sea Grant and it'll come up or Vincent and I will put the link in the chat box for you. Just a reminder to please use the chat feature to ask questions and don't unmute yourselves. And with that, I am pleased to announce our first speaker of the 2021 Virtual Water Ambassador webinar series, uh, Kathy LaMartina. Kathy is actually one of the core members of the Water Ambassador workshops. So for those of you who have taken a face-to-face -face workshop, Kathy is usually always present. Um, Kathy has over 35 years of experience in the environmental and water resources field. Her knowledge, skills, and abilities include an advanced knowledge and understanding of South Florida hydrology, ecology, and water management concepts, a thorough knowledge of local, regional, state, and federal agencies, and understanding of their function in relation to water resource issues. She's demonstrated skills in consensus building, conflict identification and resolution, negotiation, problem solving, and team building in order to manage and work effectively through complex programs and projects, demonstrated leadership initiative and interpersonal skills with oral and written communications. Kathy's areas of specialization include water resources management, intergovernmental partnership contracts and grants, stormwater management design, water resource education, and research and reaching decision makers, stakeholders, and citizens through effective outreach programs and high impact projects like the Water Ambassador Program today. So we are pleased to um, introduce Kathy. And at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and turning over to her. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, Kathy, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we see your slides. Okay, um, just a little bit about me. I know you heard about my professional life, but my personal life, just so y'all know, I've lived here in Stewart 
for 45 years, if not more. And uh, I've raised my family here, so I'm not an outsider, just letting you all know. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about water management, <clears throat> specifically the system and how it functions. So to start off with, the major watershed in South Florida is the KOE, or Kissimmee Okeechobee Everglades Watershed. And I'm just asking, you guys can see my cursor, correct? Yes, we can. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, the historic water regime uh, in Florida, when, when it rained, water would flow south from the Kissimmee River into Lake Okeechobee. The lake would fill up, overflow its southern banks, and inch southward to the Everglades, and eventually find its way to either Florida Bay <coughs> or, um, or the, the Atlantic. But now we have a man-made system that does not mimic nature and quickly directs water out to sea. So how does it have to happen? Well, it's important to recognize that the roots of the water are starting. Kathy, we are having some audio issues. Okay. I'm not sure how to correct that. Um, Vincent, are you having audio issues too, or is it something on my end? Uh, no, I am as well. It was uh, coming in crackling. Wow. Okay, let's try again and we'll see if maybe it resolved itself. <clears throat> uh, does it sound any better now? It does, yes. Much better. Okay. <clears throat> so it's important to recognize that the roots of water control started well before the regional flood control system was authorized in 1948. South Florida's water history was shaped by three major events. Under the Swamp and Overflow Land Act, the federal government conveyed wetlands to the state of Florida on the condition that they be drained. And in the late 1800s, navigation and commerce ruled the day and entrepreneurs took advantage of that. Hamilton Diston bought 4 million acres from the state of Florida at 25 cents per acre, and he dredged canals to interconnect the chain of lakes north of the Kissimmee River. This helped keep the state fund afloat and created a navigable waterway from Kissimmee to Lake Okeechobee. The drained land also allowed farming and ranching to develop in the Kissimmee River Basin. How's the audio? Good, thank yeah. you. <clears throat> okay. So, sounds great, Kathy. Okay, great. In the early 1900s, the mantra of the day for Lake Okeechobee and the Southern region was also drain the swamp. And the state of Florida got into the reclamation business with the creation of the Everglades Drainage District in 1905. This phase of drainage included surveying the remote Everglades and the construction of major canals connecting Lake Okeechobee to the coast. This concerted action resulted in 225 miles of canals and allowed the start of productive farming south of Lake Okeechobee. Early settlers knew that enduring the extreme weather was a way of life in Florida. And when the storms of 1926 and 28 nearly flattened the new frontier, many of these folks considered the state inhospitable. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers began construction in 1930 to enclose the lake behind a more substantial barrier, the Herbert Hoover Dyke. It was a seven-year public works project, and it helped boost the region's economy during the peak years of the Great Depression. But Mother Nature wasn't finished yet, and in 1947, two hurricanes and a tropical disturbance struck central and south Florida. Some areas received more than 100 inches of rain, and more than 90% of southeastern Florida was inundated. You can see that on this map up here. All of the blue area is the area that was flooded during 1947. 
and standing water was six to seven feet deep and it took months to dissipate. In 1948, Congress adopted the Central and Southern Florida Project, a planned system of flood control works to cover 16,000 square miles of South Florida. The system would also have water supply, navigation, and conservation benefits, representing the start of a more comprehensive approach to water management in the state. The state also acted, and in 1949, the Florida legislature created the Central and Southern Florida Flood Control District, which is the pre pre predecessor of the South Florida Water Management District. And uh, this entity was to serve as the local sponsor for the federal works. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers would design and build the project, and the local sponsor was responsible for buying the land ahead of time and operating and maintaining the system when it was complete. So uh, this is a map of the Central uh, and South Florida project components, which included channelization of the rivers, such as the Kissimmee River, the St. Lucie River and the Caloosahatchee River, um, a, uh, a, a, a dike around the entire 120 mile perimeter of Lake Okeechobee, the Herbert Hoover Dike, the creation of the water conservation areas, and additional levees for protection, including the Everglades Agricultural Area Levee and the East, Lower East Coast Levee. And of course, the sea canals and the drainage structures along the coast, which includes the salinity structures as well. So after construction of the CNSF system, the federal government basically signed it over to the state of Florida to operate and maintain. In 1961, the state through leg legislation created the South Florida Water Management District and the four other water management districts in the state. Today, the South Florida Water Management District includes 18,000 square miles uh, of land with 2,100 miles of canals, 2,100 miles of levees, more than 600 water control structures, 625 project culverts, 70 pump stations, including one of the largest in the world. And I actually believe this number is low now, but 8.7 million residents in South Florida alone. More than 3 million acres of agriculture, which again, I believe is actually a little high. And uh, all of the yellow area is the protected natural areas in South Florida. So this is our part of the CNSF project. So let's take a look at how the system was put together and how it functions. So these are the drainage basins today in Martin and St. Lucie County. And I will say that due to the project, these basins are about a third larger than the original drainage basins pre-construction of this project. Okay, the area's connection and the area's only connection to Lake Okeechobee is through the C-44 down here um, at the S-308 structure. The C-23, the C-24, and the C-25 canals are not connected to the lake. They are drainage facilities for the individual basins within the region. Okay, this slide is the coastal weir, which is called the S-48, on the C-23 canal along Murphy Road in uh, Palm City, and we are looking west. The elevation of this weir is eight feet, and the downstream of the weir is tidal. So the weir acts as a saltwater barrier for groundwater west of the weir. Approximately two miles upstream is another gated structure, the S97. Well, I, sh I should say a gated structure because this particular weir is not gated, it is permanent. <clears throat> so the uh, upstream, two miles upstream, is a gated structure, structure, the S97, and water levels there are held between 18 and 21 feet, mainly for local water supply purposes. 
So the step down of the system is 18 feet to eight feet to tide. This is the S80 structure at the locks off of State Road 76. One thing to note is that when these gates are open, it does not necessarily mean that water is being discharged from the lake. As I showed you previously um, in that slide, the structure called S308, which is the structure at the lake, has to be open for water to leave the lake and flow down the C44 canal and discharge out of this structure. So if the S308 structure is closed and this structure is open, the only water that is leaving this structure is from the local basin. Okay. Um, and these structures, again, are salinity barriers for Western Martin County. The C44 has its own watershed, as was shown in the previous slide. And of course, we know that if the lake is open and it's been raining in the area, so water is discharged also from the basins associated with the C23 and C24 canal that all produces an excessive amount of freshwater discharge, which absolutely have a detrimental effect on the estuary. Inflows to Lake Okeechobee occur mainly from the north and the east and frequently exceed the total outfall of the lake. And um, what I want you to note in this slide is that the arrows, the red arrows, are structures that allow water to come into the lake. The blue arrows are arrows <clears throat> that allow water, are structures that allow water to leave the lake and the size of the arrow denotes the amount of water that can go through that structure. So what that's saying is that the bigger the arrow, the more water either enters or leaves the lake. And so as you can see, it's very disproportionate. So much more water can enter the lake than can actually leave the lake through these man-made structures. And that's shown right here. Then if you look at the outflow structures, which are in blue, actually the only substantial structures are the east and west structures. The structures to the south are relatively small compared to those, and the capacity of the structures to the south is only 14%, where the east-west structures contain 86% of that outflow. Management of the system is shared with the um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So when you look at the lake itself, all of the red circle structures are managed by the Corps along with the C-44 canal itself. And that's because the C-44 canal is a designated Lake Okeechobee federal waterway. So they maintain that entire waterway. The blue triangular structures are controlled by the Water Management District. Okay, so now what we're going to see is just a demonstration of how the system works. Okay, so this is South Florida. It's a rainy, rainy day everywhere. What happens in the system when this rain enters it? Okay, so waters come into the lake from the north, mainly through the Kissimmee River. Runoff starts collecting in the EAA, which is the Everglades Agricultural Area, south of the lake, and it enters those little canals that, and, and goes south um, to either the water conservation areas or the stormwater treatment areas or even to tide. Okay, the water management district will then open up those small structures that allow water to leave the lake and flow south, and that will go through the EAA area to the water conservation areas via the stormwater treatment areas or to tide. At the same time, water's collecting in the C43 basin to the west. It gets into the C43 canal 
goes out the S79 discharge structure to the Caloosahatchee estuary, meets up with the tidal basin, which that water flows into the estuary, and they all flow into the Gulf of Mexico. The same thing happens on the East Coast at the C44 basin runoff, collects, enters the C44 canal, heads to the S80 discharge structure, enters the St. Lucie estuary, floors, flows east, and meets up with the tidal uh, um, flow into the estuary and goes into the Atlantic Ocean. So when this when the system is full, everything is fine. But if it doesn't stop raining, which a lot of times it doesn't, then you have to start opening up the uh, S308 structure on our side of the lake, which allows a lot of water from Lake Okeechobee to enter the C44 canal, go through the S80 structure, meet with all of that other fresh water, and that's when we have an issue, you know, with the estuaries. The same thing happens on the West Coast with the S77 structure, and that's how the system works. Just, uh, just a note, though, is that the S308 and the S77 are always kept closed unless the core feels that there's a safety issue. That's when they open those structures and uh, release discharges to the estuaries to the east and west. Okay, so where does this water come from? Well, you know, when you have open and pervious land, the land has the capacity to store water and it allows the water to either percolate into the ground, evaporate into the air, or run off into the rivers and oceans. After development is complete, however, oops, we're not going to come up. the tremendous amount of impervious surface cannot store water. It cannot allow water to percolate into the ground, so all the water runs off, thus delivering more water faster than what drains naturally. So, so what is to all the excess sediment run? Well, it's very, very important to know low, low. Where, where your runoff goes and how it gets there. We all, we all have a role to play in preparing for storm season by managing our property to preserve water quality and prevent flooding. And if you understand how the stormwater is supposed to flow, you can let managers know when and where there may be a problem. And if you understand who's responsible for the maintenance of the stormwater management system, you can help get those problems resolved quickly. So stormwater management in South Florida is a three-tiered system. The tertiary drainage system is another word for it is your, drain, your neighborhood system. Then there's the secondary drainage system, which is either a local drainage district, a county, or a city. And then the primary drainage system is the South Florida Water Management District canals, natural rivers, or other waterways. Okay, drainage superhighways are the major canals and pump stations that are operated by the South Florida Water Management District. These are connected to secondary canals operated by the local water control districts, the cities, or the county. You've seen this slide before, but the sea canals are the primary drainage system in Martin and St. Lucie County. Okay, those are the facilities that the water management district owns, operates, and maintains. We do not own or operate or maintain any other facilities except the ones located in these canals, and that's the C23, 24, and 25. In turn, the secondary system connects to farms, neighborhoods, or homeowners associations, uh, and so, and it's which is which are sometimes called the tertiary system. Okay, a lot of people don't know what special drainage districts are. 
um, I'll give you the names of a few that are in Martin and St. Lucie County, one being the uh, Fort Pierce Farms Water Control District, North St. Lucie River Water Control District, um, what's another one, Hope Sound Conservancy. Those are all special drainage districts, and there happen to be 72, I actually think there's more than this number two, in South Florida. Okay, so in the neighborhood, excess water drains first into swales, ditches, stormwater grates, and then it flows from that tertiary stormwater system to the secondary canals. Then the secondary canals carry it to the larger primary canals, leading to the regional storage or to the coast. Okay, so you have the neighborhood canals that then flow into the secondary canals, which could be owned by a county, city, or a drainage district, which then flow into the regional canals, which are number three, which at that point, can, they can, the water can either go to a, a storage system or out to tide. Okay, so now you know how the system's connected and how it's operated. And in Florida, we have two seasons, a rainy season and a dry season. And this chart shows that very well. Okay, we get most of our rain, almost 80% in um, the wet season, uh, denoted by the blue bars. Okay, floods can happen when large amounts of rainfall occur in a short period of time. And flooding can result from a single heavy prolonged storm as well as from tropical systems or hurricanes. And another key point to remember is that as the ground becomes saturated with rain, just from regular rainstorms, there's more likelihood of surface water ponding or standing water in the streets and yards after a downpour as the season progresses. Okay, roads, roads neighborhood drainage, drainage systems, systems, excuse me, and even house pad elevations are designed to specifically the rain of rain events. Okay, so a road storm is a storm that produces about four to seven inches of rain in a 24-hour period. You can expect to see water standing in yards, swales, and ditches, but the crowns of the road should remain passable during this storm. A design storm is a storm that produces seven to 10 inches of rain in the 72 hour period. And you can expect that roads as well as swales, ditches, and yards will flood, but buildings should remain dry. Now, a 100-year storm produces 10 to 14 inches of rain in 72 hours. At this point, many homes and businesses can be expected to flood. Okay, so the, this is just some of the storms that we've had in recent years and how much rainfall they have produced. So in knowing what you just heard on how systems are designed and to what uh, amount of rain they are designed to, you can imagine that during Barry in 2001, uh, the roads were probably flooded. Okay, Francis, the roads could be a little bit flooded, but not too bad. Ivan, Jean, Wilma, 16 inches. Now that's pushing it, okay? So that could be where the roads are flooded and possibly you know, some homes. Bay, Tradition, Isaac, like I said, just some of the storms that we've had in the recent past. So, um, <clears throat> but understand that the Water Management District, as managers of the primary system, is staffed 24-7, and we have already um, typically opened our structures and our gates for several days preceding the major storm. We monitor the rainfall and storm activity 24 hours a day from our control room in West Palm Beach. So we are as prepared as we can be 
before these storms hit. So what can you do? Well, what you need to do first is find out who's responsible for your neighborhood drainage system. Is it an HOA? Is it a special district or county? If it's an HOA or POA, find out if your drainage system is inspected regularly and check to see if trash, dead vegetation, sediment, if those things are being removed. Your water management system must meet the permit specification so that the system will work as designed. All sizes, depths, heights, lengths, and side slopes should meet all of the permit specifications. The number one cause of flooding is debris. Okay, so utilize storm-wise landscaping and perform major trimming of landscape prior to storm season. Secure your lawn and patio furniture before a storm. Where water leaves the property, there is sometimes a discharge control structure called a weir. The structure should have a functioning baffle or trash collector, collector to prevent blockage and hold back floating oils and debris. Homeowners associations, property managers, and residents all play a role in managing flood situations by maintaining their community stormwater systems. Residents in South Florida should inspect, maintain, and repair those drainage systems before the rainy season. An inspection should be repeated when a major storm threatens. Keep in mind that permitted systems have specific engineering requirements, so check with the South Florida Water Management District or your local drainage district if you have questions. <clears throat> Debris needs to be removed pre-storm and post-storm. Okay, so understanding your regional system is knowing that South Florida is flat, rains are seasonal, and most drainage occurs through a series of water control structures and facilities. Drainage is interconnected. Home drainage is connected to community drainage, which is connected to a county or local system, which is in most cases connected to a regional system. Drainage systems require maintenance and repair, and action is needed before the rainy season. Changes that go beyond or conflict with existing permits require review and authorization before proceeding. So what that means, if you need, if you need to, if something does need to be fixed or changed, you need to get authorization or a permit modification um, to do that before, before you do that. So if in doubt, ask first. And again, debris is the number one cause of flooding. I can't stress that enough. Um, with that said, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Uh, if you go on our website, there is a ton of information there. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I think monitoring the chat box, we had one question um, from Megan Bach, who asks, were the structures and canal numbers given to each based on the total number of each? For example, there was a structure 308. Does that mean that there are over 300 structures? Yes, there's that. There's actually over 700 structures in the, the entire system. Okay, thank you. That is the only question we have posted thus far. If you don't mind waiting maybe a minute or two just to see. Um, oh, more questions. Okay. Um, are there pumps located in these structures that can dictate the direction of water flow, or are they limited to the direction you pointed out? In Martin and St. Lucie County, there are no pumps on the structures that I showed you there um, in the water conservation areas and in a lot of the areas south. There are pumps because it's a lot uh, more flat. So, you know, we have to assist. Uh, with moving water down there and um, yeah the pumps are directional and if you're interested in 
learning more about the facilities, you can go on our website and we have a facility map that um, points to, to all of the structures that we have, including the project culverts and the pumps. And you can also go on our web website and get live information from the structures. So you can go there and you can request a structure, click on it, and it will show you what the elevations of the water are upstream, downstream, what's flowing through the structure, if anything is, you know, if it's open, not open. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Okay, great. We have other questions coming in, which I'm going to read out. But before I read the next one, I'm going to launch an evaluation poll for our participants. It's only a handful of questions. So if you can multitask and listen to Kathy answer the questions while completing the poll, we'd appreciate it. The next question is from David Capel. Will sea level rise have any effect on the primary drainage system? Um, I can't answer yes or no right at the moment, but I can tell you that we have, uh, we are studying that. And um, I, I'm just gonna, this is my personal belief that up, up here in Martin and St. Lucie County, we're a little bit, uh, it's, it's, we're a little bit better off than if we were in Broward or Miami-Dade. I know that it does, you know, affect them a lot more. So, uh, but yeah, we, we, are, we are currently reviewing that and we are constantly reviewing that actually. So we'll see what happens. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question is, how does the district keep track of all the new development occurring and how this dictates the volume of water that is being dispersed throughout the system? Okay, well, first and foremost, the district does not approve any development, okay? The, de the development has to be pre-approved by either a county or municipality. But at that point in time, when it is approved by the county or municipality, the district is required to permit the system. So uh, when the developer comes in to permit the system, they have to meet requirements to get a permit. I mean, we don't just give them a permit. But if they do meet the requirements of all of our permits, then we have to um, issue a permit to them. Uh, we have a, an extensive system that does show permit the permits that are within the district. And again, you can go on our website and you can look them all up. Uh, you can go to a map that will uh, uh, bring up all the permits and you can look at them and what it's permitted for, et cetera. Okay, great. That is the last of our questions for now. I want to thank you for a great presentation and I want to thank all of our participants for joining us today. Um, please give us about a week to post the recording on the website link that was provided in the chat box and hopefully we will see you on January 26th for um, our presentation on WeShore, Living Shorelines and Connecting Homeowners and Contractors. So thank you again, Kathy. Thank you.